Do you love the idea of personal growth, but find the practice of it exhausting? We get it. We're Brandon and Megan Giggling, growth coaches with the mission to put the personal back in personal growth. If you want a new way of growing into the next version of you without the frustration, guilt, and overwhelm, you're in the right place. It's time to rethink your growth journey and make it into something that works for you. You in? Welcome to Growth Reframed. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of Growth Reframed. We are so happy you're here. How are you doing today, Maggie? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing so well. I'm actually super full because we just had a great meal. Uh, but I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to ruffle some feathers right off the bat. Uh, and so this is exciting and uh, and I like this. But today we're going to talk all about why you, if you are, I should preface, if you are coddling your kids and three really great reasons why you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know, I know y'all before I even start that as a parent, look, you know, I, I we have an almost 10 year old and we have a six year old and I get it. Like I want to make their life easier. I want to do things to help them. And certainly right off the top, what I'm not saying is that you can't help them, that you can't support them, that you can't be there for them, that you can't shelter them a little bit because this world's freaking nuts. So like you definitely need to be there and be able to shelter them from some of the things. We always joke that our kids live in a happy little bubble. And sometimes, yeah, I want to keep them in their little happy little net and bubble because they're still super young. We also understand that some of you listening out there might have older kids, but I think these principles can be worked in no matter what, because one of the things we've noticed is just people are, people are really just caught on their dang kids. <laughs> they definitely are. And so I think that it's important here to distinguish that like, we're really not talking about sheltering your kids from things they shouldn't see as, you know, dependent on their age. We're really not talking about that. We're talking about the fact that some people don't let their kids not suffer, suffer is a bad word, Brian, but they don't let their kids experience or they don't let their kids uh, have meaningful, hard things that they go through to help them become the person they will eventually be because they're so worried about like their immediate needs and their immediate emotions and immediate reactions. And I think that's where we're a little bit different from a lot of parents is we're like, okay, yeah, it might really, really suck for them in the moment, but this is actually good for them. And so we're not going to constantly retract what we're saying and undo and move things around for the comfort of our children. We're going to instead push them into things that are a little bit uncomfortable that they may not want to do. Um, those kind of things, not so much that, you know, sheltering is bad because sheltering is great. We shelter the absolute mess out of our kids. I mean, we do, but coddling is a whole other story. Right. And and I know why people do it. Um, well, let me back up here. We live in a world of instant gratification where we want everything right now. And then we wonder like why our kids are that way, but we do it that way too. And so let me say that I know how it happens. It happens because your kid, especially the younger they are, They want something, they're freaking out, something happens, and you immediately want to fix that to stop them, can I be honest, from being really annoying and irritating. Mm -hmm. Or just to be like, man, I don't want them to be hurt, so let's fix this. Like, oh, are you okay? And we overreact, and we we uh, over-insert ourselves and over-helicopter on the kids at any given time. And what you're touching on, Meg, is it's not about the sheltering, it's about the building resilience. We talk a lot about on here as adults about building resilience and how you have to build up that muscle. But in order for that to happen, stuff has to happen to you. You have to allow it to happen. And Meg, I know Meg's going to laugh when I say this because my favorite thing to say is when you're doing that to your kids and you're saying, well, okay, honey, you don't want to do that. Okay. Well, you don't have to do that because you don't want to, even though you committed to it. And even though, you know, we said we were going to do it and you gave your word. That, that's fine. We don't need to do that. What I always say to Meg is, okay, but what's going to happen to that kid when they get out into the real world and they have a teacher or a boss who's like, hey, you have to do this. And you're like, no, you know, I don't really want to. Well, guess what? You're not going to have a job anymore. And so like, what are you setting them up for in the future? And I think it comes, and I want to say this very clearly, with the best of intentions, why we're doing it, why we're coddling, 
why we're trying to fix it for them, but you're actually a crutch for them. And if they're younger, it's kind of acceptable, but as they get older, it can really deter what they're trying to do, y'all. Like, uh, one more thing that yeah. I have to say. There is a new trend that I saw that I was like, I was floored when I saw this. I, I couldn't even believe this was real. So I did, did a little bit more research. It's real. There are parents showing up to the first interview for a job, like a professional job, not a job at McDonald's, with their kids. So these are 24-year-olds? Yeah, like 24, 25-year-old kid is showing up and saying, hi, Mr. Smith. Yes, I really think I'm qualified for this job. You can just ask my mommy and daddy over here. <laughs> And I'm a, I, I run a business and let me just tell you, I'd say next, like I, I'm done. Like that is, that is, it goes beyond. So I think the, the sooner that you can realize it, the better, because you're ultimately doing it not to deter your kids, not to have it be a bad thing, to make it be a really positive thing because you're building that resilience muscle so they can go out and conquer the world. Yeah. It's, it's so crazy because as I think about like generationally, I'm thinking like, I'm not coddled. They, no, like our grandparents did not coddle our parents, period. Like, I just know that for a fact. Like, it was just a different time. Like, you did not just get to do what you thought and your parents were just totally cool with it. Like, my mom and my dad, and I know your parents be, were not anywhere near coddled. But then like a couple generations go by and like, I feel like, you know, I was definitely more coddled than my parents would have been. And now I feel like we coddle our kids, even though we actively fight against it, still naturally, we do a little bit more coddling probably than our parents did for us. And I think it's just like this weird trend that's kind of going like as, as generations pass by, we're getting a little more comfortable and just making everything okay for our kids all the time. And so it is something you have to actively kind of fight against because it is in our nature to want to make everything better and to fix all of our baby's problems. And I just think back to when our daughter had just finished I want to say she had just finished kindergarten and she had to go to a summer camp and was this after kindergarten? She was pretty young. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And, uh, we enrolled her in like this summer camp, which is essentially daycare for big kids. <laughs> and, uh, it just wasn't the place for her. And I'm telling you the whole summer long, she cried every day, every morning, like to the fact, like we were like, Oh, this is so awkward. Like, what should we do? Should we just pull her out? And we're like, no, we're, we're, we're two working parents. We can't. Like, there's nothing we can do. She has to go in every single day, Monday to Friday. She has to be here. There's no other option. We've already paid for this. We Like, there's no, like there's literally nothing we could do. And at that point, there wasn't even another camp that we could have done that would have made a difference because it was just like this, this mental block that she was having against being here in the summer. And uh, I'm sure that most parents thought we were crazy. And I'm sure that had we told anyone this story, they would have been like, well, pull her out and just keep her home for the summer. And... The best part is like we never had the ability to do it. And so she had to do that. And by doing that, she actually became stronger. She actually became better at going into these situations that she had to eventually start going into more and more, which was being in a summer camp situation, being in a spring break, bringing a track out, whatever you're going to call it. There are all these moments in her in her school career that are going to keep coming up where her friends might not be involved. And she's not going to have her best friend sitting on the side with her. And she's going to have to do it anyway. And she's going to have to get uncomfortable. And it's actually served her really well because over the past few years, she's been an expert at going to school by herself if her brother's sick, trying a new uh, activity by herself when she doesn't know if any of her friends are going to sign up or not. She has been able to do aftercare and camps where she's not sure who's going to show up and all of these things where a lot of the people in her life in her orbit are not able to do those sort of things because they're just not expected to. They're just, they haven't had that opportunity to. And I think it makes her stronger and more able to adapt and, and to cope with this thing. And same for our son, as he gets older, he's been able to more easily adapt to these situations. His whole kindergarten year, he sobbed every day. We told him he had to go to aftercare. He would be so mad at us. And guess what? Now he's in first grade. Now he just accepts that that's his reality and he doesn't cry because we never fixed it for him. We were like, sorry, kid, you have two working parents. Go to aftercare. Love you. Bye. <laughs> yep, and and so do. he adapted. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, in, in we we're, we're hammering home how it like it builds resilience, but it also is fostering independence. It's getting them to a place where they can do things on their own, which ultimately as a parent, I believe, is our ultimate goal, that there be a good, productive citizen of the world. Like, you know, they're going to go out and be a 
handling themselves appropriately. But if you never allow them to experience that, then you can't do that. And if you, if you come in and you swoop in and you fix it immediately, then you're telling them by your actions that yet they are incapable of doing it. Yeah, I totally get you can't you you really don't have the skill set to rough this out. You really don't have the skills to go ahead and do this. You aren't capable of fixing this for yourself. You need so us. I'm going to go ahead and fix it for you and I'm going to fix this for you. Mm-hmm. And again, y'all, if your kids are younger, it's almost more acceptable, but as they get older, you have to experience it cuz like Meg said, we've had a lot of those conversations even recently because coming up here, our kids are going to have spring break and we work So they go to camp. They don't like going to camp. And we literally have the conversation Meg just said. We're like, yep, we work. We're working parents. And we like, we don't feel bad about that. Like that's something that we hope we instill in them. Like that it is important to work. That is important to do those things. It's not that we don't do fun things or try to do things, you know, throughout that process. But like you were saying, Meg, the fostering that independence and getting that skill to be able to take on new things, it, even in the face of not knowing, is huge. And then the last point I wanted to make is it's encouraging growth throughout the whole the whole time. Because naturally, you're more comfortable in doing those things. Therefore, you're more likely to be doing them. Therefore, you're being forced into them anyway. So you're going to have to adapt and grow and learn and shift and maneuver and make new friends and try new things and do things independently by yourself. It's impossible in all of those things to grow, to not grow. And we've actually seen our kids grow tremendously this year just because of this kind of experience that they've had where we try not to fix, where we try to get them involved in things that may not be super comfortable for them immediately because either, number one, we we actively are seeking that out, or number two, it's by necessity. But either way, we have seen tremendous growth, and each of them decided to start a new activity recently. And it's kind of funny because it ended up being that both of them have friends in the, in the new activity, but it didn't start out that way. And so they both went in blind, not really knowing, agreeing to do these things. Uh, our daughter signed up for ballet and our son signed up for karate. And neither one at the time that they signed up understood or knew or had any clue, because I didn't either, if there would be a friend involved, if they would know somebody in the class. They had to independently decide like, hey, yeah, I... I'm a little bit scared to do this activity. I know nothing about it. I also don't know that I'm going to know anybody here. I probably won't. And I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to try something new. It's going to scare me. And I'm going to try it alone. It's just also really scary. And I'm okay because I know that in the past I've done these things and they've all worked out. Mm -hmm. And I've been through this before in a different setting and it worked out for me. I've grown. I've used that muscle enough. And so now I know that I'm strong enough to do these new things. And I think that that message that we've given our kids is invaluable. Yeah. And I'll just leave you all with this. It's easier to do it in the short term. It's easier to coddle. It's easier to fix. It's easier to just make it right for them. So you don't have to hear what they're doing and, and you don't have to hear their problems and you, you can fix it for them. Yeah, that makes it easier for you right now. But coddling makes it much more difficult down the road. You're actually harming them and you're harming yourself because you're keeping yourself connected and as they mature and get older, like you want them to build that muscle and get mature and be able to do those things. So don't take the easy out now. I get it'll be difficult. I get they might fight it. I get they might cry. I get they might be upset. But ultimately, you're doing what's in their best interest, which I believe is your number one job as a parent. We love y'all. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Growth Reframed. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. We would love to connect with you. So shoot us a DM on Instagram at growth reframed. We love y'all.